Uh, welcome everybody to this session. As you might have noticed, I'm not Fiona. I'm Cliff Macmillan. I, I volunteered to deputize for my colleague Fiona when she realized she'd need a jet ski in order to get off and get to her next meeting later this afternoon. So um, we are both principals at uh, Arab and so we share an interest in what you're all interested in here this afternoon and that is city issues, resilience, sustainability, uh, how we can deal with extreme events. And I think the, the panel topic is well chosen, build a good study, build a better coast. And I will interpret that to, to be the study including the science that we all rely on to define the extreme events and certainly not only an obsession with Sandy, important as that has been in all of our discussions today. And then moving through studies, the studies of what uh, we can all do and what the, 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 the solutions may be. And we also have a diversity of uh, uh, kinds of, of issues to contend with. So holistic is, is, is a big word to me. Uh, the other thing is that we need appropriateness. Uh, there has been quite a lot of reference to big in infrastructure interventions uh, already today. Those are very important and have their place, but we've also got to think of the small and community level in uh, interventions which will improve the situation. Um, resilience has been referred to as a really big word today, a word that virtually didn't exist in our vocabulary a few months ago and now everybody professes to have something to say about. But resilience is really a, a, a rather intangible um, term. Uh, to me it means something like the ability to bounce back. Um, it has to do with working well within the system capacity so that we don't put our systems under pressure. It has to do with providing alternative and redundant paths for necessary functions, both in the sense of the electricity <coughs> grid, shall we say, but also in the sense of how we transmit and receive information. It has to do with simplicity at its core, uh, so that it's all understandable. It has to do with something like graceful failure and learning from continuous change. So resilience is a big issue. To me, another very big issue in connecting the dots, if you think of it from the perspective of the likes of us that are trying, in the end, to grapple with all these things out there, the, the, in, the data, the scientific information, the possible solutions and, and options, uh, ultimately down to implementation, to grapple with all of that, the issue of priorit prioritization is, is absolutely critical. How do, we, how do we, we go about prioritizing the vast number of things we could be uh, dealing with? And another word that's important in that context, I think, is vulnerability. Vulnerability not only in the sense of the system itself that you may be thinking about, but also in terms of its effect downstream to debilitate an entire community, cause loss of life, etc., etc. So that is what I interpret uh, the challenge to be for our panel. Uh, I sincerely hope that they will help us to understand how to grapple with that relationship between the science of extreme events, the vulnerability of our systems, and the way in which resili resilience can be improved all around. So to introduce our panel very briefly, um, two of them you may already have heard of if you were in the right panel earlier this morning. Um, but uh, Garrett, Garrett Graves, uh, next to me, is Chairman of Coastal Protection and Restoration of, uh, Authority. Um, next to uh, him, I think, is Philip Orton that we saw this morning and uh, uh, dropped some pearls of wisdom for us that some of us at least liked. He's uh, a PhD <laughs> and research scientist at the Stevens Institute of Technology. Um, next to him is Nikhil Krishman, an associate principal at McKinsey's. Um, and then we have um, Roselle uh, Hen, who is standing in for her colleague, and Roselle ha ha occupies an important position with the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, she is, in fact, um, a deputy uh, of the National Planning uh, Center uh, involved with coastal and storm risk management. 
And then we have Daniel Hitchings, Vice President of Arcadis US. And finally, on my extreme right, uh, we have Malcolm Bowman, who we have also uh, heard from already today, and I'm sure we'll hear, hear much more. So with that, may I hand over to our esteemed moderator, uh, retired Colonel from the Army Corps, and now Vice President at Parton Brinkerhoff, John Buhle. Thank you, Cliff, and uh, thanks to all our panelists. I will uh, remind uh, Philip and uh, Malcolm that they are respondents uh, on this panel, which means uh, we're, they're not, that's, that's an improvement over being a panelist. Uh, first you start uh, as a panelist, and then when you do well, they make you a respondent. Uh, so they tried out uh, a, a couple of hours ago, and they passed, and so we've decided to make them both respondents in this panel. So let's give them a round of applause for making it to the next level. Uh, what, uh, I, I'm, I'm just, you know, with these two gentlemen, you have to put controls, management controls upon them. And that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, I, I will tell you that, um, <laughs> that's right. Good, good point, Malcolm. Um, what, what I think, uh, you know, I'm going to give you some advice. So many of you belong to organizations uh, where you have people who talk a lot, you ask them for a status report or an update and you know a half an hour later you wanted that half an hour of your life back. Uh, you know the kind of people I'm talking about. Uh, and a uh, <laughs> lot, lot of those people work in the Army Corps of Engineers. I won't mention any names. But um, I, I will tell you when, uh, when you really want something short, what you tell people is just give me the five W's. That's all. That's what I want. Give me the five W's: the who, what, when, where, and why, and then give me give me the how. Maybe a little bit about the how. So, when when, when you get somebody who's telling you a, a big long story, I suggest you just say, "Hey, give me the five W's." You know, I got to run. That's just a, that's a little bit of a time management hint for you for free for your registration. <laughs> so really, what I want to do is talk about what the five W's are. Here, this is a panel about the study. So let's talk about the five W's for a very brief moment of time because you don't want to hear from me, you want to hear about our, from our panelists. So what is the what? Well, the what is, is, is all about the problem solving methodology that is gonna lead us to a series of recommendations about what we should do to address some of those key words that Cliff was talking about earlier. And I think step number one is to define what the problem is. You know, it's hard to get to the right answer if you don't start with the right question. What's the objective? What do we want to accomplish with this study? Where are we headed? Begin with the end in mind. Let's get to the, to the why. Many of you sitting out there and many of you maybe on this table think, why do I need to do a study? I know what we need to do in New York and New Jersey so that Sandy doesn't happen again or Sandy 2 or something like that doesn't happen again and we don't have the kind of damage uh, that we did in the last one. Well, I'll tell you, many of you are in business and when you make a large business investment decision, uh, you're going to do a little bit of planning before you invest the kind of money we're talking about in the billions of dollars or the tens of billions of dollars. Uh, and that's exactly what the federal government demands. It's the same level of investment planning that goes into making this multi-billion dollar recommendation. So that's the why. Who? Who should be involved in this study? Is this just uh, the, the, the EDC from the city, maybe the state DEC and the Corps of Engineers sitting in a room? Uh, with the door closed and locked from the inside, uh, determining what the solution be should be. What stakeholders? Who stakeholders? Which? Who needs to be involved? Should academia be involved? Should industry be involved? Should government be involved at all levels? What about civic organizations? Well, who is the who that should be involved in the studies? Where? 
where should the study be? Is this study that should be limited to New York City? Should we include the coast of, or, or the, the Hudson River that we're sailing upon right now? Maybe, maybe we, we include the Jersey Shore on that side? What is the where? And the where is pretty important because if you're not in the where, you're not part of the solution. So when you define the where of the study, uh, you're defining the area that you're going to bring solutions to. So interesting that the study has to kind of define what the where is. What about the when? We've got a little experience about from the Corps of Engineers, and I can tell you the when is a really important question to the Corps because the when generally means a long, long time from now. <laughs> and people don't like to hear that. When are you going to get done the study? When is something going, the solution going to be available? When is Congress going to appropriate, authorize, and then appropriate funds? And I'm looking at the core. Could be a New York City study. Could be, it could be a, a New York State or New Jersey study also. The when. When are we going to see work being done in the water, on the ground? And then I would say, I think I covered, uh, I think I covered the five W's and a little bit about the how. And I think uh, Cliff talked about that quite nicely. Uh, how will it be done? And I know Roselle is going to talk a little bit about this. What are the factors? What are the considerations? Is my most important factor part of the how on how this study is going to get done? So I, I think it's key that we kind of focus using the study as a problem-solving methodology to come up with the solution and we look at those five W's and the H in order to get to that formulation, that series of recommendations that makes sense for our government to invest multi-billion dollars worth of resources, your taxpayers, my, your, your money uh, involved in, uh, in the solution. So with that uh, we spent uh, several hours together in a closed room deciding who was going to speak and what they were going to talk about uh, a few days ago. And uh, Roselle got the, the short straw, so she gets to speak first. But what we have on this panel is we've got uh, an expert who's a core planner uh, who's going to tell us a little bit about what she knows about how the core does planning and how this particular core study the five W's and H from her point of view. And then we've got a couple of gentlemen who've got some experience in a little place called Louisiana where there was a, somewhat of a, of a storm that, that rolled on past there a few years ago. And maybe we can learn something from them uh, that we can incorporate into what we're trying to do here in this region. And then we've got another gentleman uh, who's got worldwide experience working for McKinsey in kind of how to solve challenges in general, how to do planning, how, what are the factors that are involved, a lot of the H's in, in his experience that may uh, be related to coastal protection but, but may be related to problem solving in general which may be helpful to inform this process. So with that I'm going to ask Roselle to start us off and give us a few minutes on uh, your perspective. Roselle. Thank you very much John and welcome, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Roselle Hen, and I work for North Atlantic Division, which is also the Coastal Center for Storm Risk Reduction. And I am the deputy for Joseph Vitri, who was supposed to join you today. Unfortunately, he could not arrive. I, I, I want to discuss the direction we're taking on a congressionally directed study called the Comprehensive Study. We're calling it the North Atlantic Coast Comprehensive Study. And this is an undertaking that came out in the Sandy uh, legislation that came, was signed in January. It directed the Corps of Engineers to conduct a study using $20 million or less and complete this work in two years. Uh, we see this as a very ambitious study. Uh, it is intended to be a comprehensive look at the region within my division, North Atlantic Division, which extends from Maine to Virginia, at the areas that were impacted by the Storm Sandy. That is how Congress directed us to proceed. 
They further directed us to conduct this study in conjunction with our regional partners. And I'm looking at a set of regional partners when I speak today. We are asked to make sure that whatever plan we develop as a result of this effort is consistent with the plans of others. So we are reaching out to our regional partners, federal, state, tribal, local governments, private sector, other sectors, NGOs, as our regional partners to help us develop a strategy that will reduce risk in the areas impacted by the storm. I think I've covered a couple of the W's, but I'll, I'll continue. Uh, so we've spent some time using the data that's al already been uh, assembled by uh, all of the partners working on the impacts of Sandy to hone in on where exactly that those impacts are most intense. And uh, so we're focusing on the New York and New Jersey areas, but some of the very high levels of impact also extend up the coast to Cape Cod and down the coast to Virginia. So those are, that is going to be our where, our primary focus. We are asked to um, be consistent with other plans. We're also being asked to consider any institutional barriers that might impede the implementation of a comprehensive plan. So this is actually a tremendous opportunity that Congress has provided to our region because we can truly um, make recommendations that might require other mechanisms to actually be implemented. We will identify actions that will require further analysis. We will inform the work with the most current tools being developed by a whole array of federal and other partners to deal with climate change and sea level rise. We anticipate undertaking surge modeling efforts to address some of those problems. And we want to include an array of alternatives that includes the full suite of possible solutions that could be combined in various ways over time, because our, our initial uh, vision is that not everything can be accomplished immediately. There may need to be a phasing of strategies to accomplish a truly comprehensive plan. But so we are looking at engineered structures. We're looking at natural systems and the benefits that wetlands and other natural features like marsh islands that we help to um, build in Jamaica Bay. How do those array, that full array, including green infrastructure, sort of a blended mix of, of natural and, and engineered solutions, how do they all contribute to reducing risk? And, and how might we begin to line those types of features, those types of components across this large region to provide different types of communities? A large part of the analysis is going to be economic, looking at the impacts of the storm from the perspective of traditional economic impacts to property and businesses, but also environmental impacts, environmental justice impacts, as many different categories of uh, loss as occurred during that catastrophic event as we can compute a metric on and count. Uh, we want to include that in the uh, analysis. I think, um, do I have another minute or have we just about one more minute? So we're, just to tell you where we are in the process right now, we have initiated uh, some scoping internally within the Corps of Engineers to develop a draft scope of work of how we might proceed and move out. Our next step is going to be to coordinate that draft as a draft with our partners across the region 
to refine it, to improve it, to build on the work that they're already undertaking, and to leverage all of our resources and activities. And uh, we will be doing that over the next uh, month or so. Uh, we've already started to reach out to um, the New York City, New York State, State of New Jersey. We're working with the HUD-led task force and the joint field offices uh, to make sure, again, that all of the plans, um, that the strategy, the risk reduction strategy that comes out of the comprehensive study is consistent with other plans. Thank you. That's a perspective of what's happening now here, but I want, I want to take us back to 2006 and what's happened uh, to gentlemen on the panel uh, that have uh, worked through Katrina uh, recovery and mitigation, and they can talk and bring some lessons learned from their uh, positions uh, at that time and what they've gained since then. And I'd like to start sort of with the state stakeholder uh, in uh, Mr. Garrett Graves, who, uh, as Cliff said, is the chairman of the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority. And Garrett, I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts uh, looking at it uh, from Katrina. Sure. Uh, thanks, Colonel. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, good to be in New York. Um, I, I'm going to, in the essence of time, I'm going to drop the southern drawl and the Cajun accent, talk fast, uh, use a lot of curse words. I just wish I had a car horn with me to uh, compliment the, the talk today. Um, honestly, I'm, I'm really sorry that, that you guys had to go through, through Hurricane Sandy uh, to bring you to this point. Um, it's, it's a very painful lesson that we had to experience in Louisiana as well. Um, a very painful lesson of Hurricane Katrina. That same year, Hurricane Rita, two of the most powerful hurricanes to hit our country. Um, uh, three years later, we had uh, Hurricane Gustav and Hurricane Ike, and last year we had uh, Hurricane Isaac, all of which caused extraordinary damages uh, to, our, to our state and uh, really put the future of our state in question in, in, in many cases. Um, first of all, I, I want to say that uh, New York's been here for 400 years, as you guys know. It, it is protectable. With smart planning, it's, it, you can be here another 400 years, again, sustainably. You can have resilient communities. but. Try to avoid the, the idea that you're going to be able to take a snapshot of today and you're going to be able to preserve that exact footprint moving forward. Recognize that, that in some cases you may actually have to, to compromise or retreat in some areas. In some areas you may be able to actually grow or expand development, but you may have to adjust the map of this area. And, and it's something that I think you, you have to be open to. You may have to do some reconfiguration. Secondly, um, Hurricane Sandy was an extraordinary event here, and it caused extraordinary damages. As you begin your planning effort, don't plan for the next Hurricane Sandy. Don't plan for the last storm. Plan for the next one. Hurricane Sandy identified some vulnerabilities in this area, but I guarantee you there are other vulnerabilities that are here with a different storm trajectory, with different storm surge, with different wind speeds. They're going to be there. Don't plan for the last storm. Plan for the next one. Um, the next point is a common vision. Uh, the, the Corps of Engineers just laid out their, their, their path forward on the, on the $20 million study. And, and if that's going to be, the, uh, if that's gonna be the, the, the venue where everyone chooses to jump in and that's going to be the common vision, then I'd urge you to jump in and participate at the, at the local level, at the NGOs, the state government, all of the, the interested stakeholders need to participate in that effort. You need to participate. You don't need to listen. You need to participate. And participate now. Um, I'll tell you, I wouldn't wish the challenge that you guys have upon anyone. You're look, I mean, think about the, the, the scope of that study, the size and the scope of that study. Congress didn't provide a floor and didn't provide a ceiling. Um, so you guys have to set those parameters. And I guarantee you, people aren't going to like them. Um, it would be great if I go back to my point about saying that it would be great if you could just take a snapshot and say, guys, we're going to... We're going to do everything for everybody. There's going to be a chicken in every pot. But that's not realistic because you're not going to be able to produce a $300 billion plan and submit it to Congress and get funded. You can develop a $300 billion plan. You can submit it to Congress. It's not going to get funded, which means you're providing false promises or false hope for people from North Carolina to Canada, and it's not reality. So 
put realistic parameters in place when you develop that study. Um, and um, along those lines, um, one of the things we did in Louisiana that I think was, was, was absolutely critical. Uh, we brought in some folks, we, did, we used a bunch of internal folks as well, and we developed a prioritization tool. We determined the things that were important to us in Louisiana, and I, I'm not here to pretend to understand what's important to you guys in New York. Things that were important to us were obviously hurricane protection or resilience from floods. Uh, we also are one of the top seafood producers, one of the top energy producers. And no offense, but we have five of the top 15 ports in the nation in Louisiana, uh, including the top tonnage port in the Western Hemisphere. And those were important things to our economy. Uh, we have a Cajun culture, we have great seafood. Uh, those things are important to us. We have alligator production, oyster, shrimp, all sorts of things. So we, identified, we developed a prioritization tool that used various metrics to measure production or measure progress in all of these different fields. Everything from hurricane and flood protection to coastal restoration, wetlands restoration, to seafood production, to carbon sequestration, to preserving economic activity, to generating additional employment opportunities, on and on and on. And we went into each of the five basins of Louisiana, and we worked with the stakeholders in those basins to help prioritize those different categories in the basin. We were actually able to tailor the prioritization tool to the basin we were working on. Then we, were, then we went through and developed projects or portfolios of projects to most efficiently achieve the objectives in those plans. All resource constrained. We were very clear. We believe everybody deserves everything. But if we're going to realistically deliver the plan within the freshwater constraints, within the sediment constraints, and very importantly within the financial constraints, we had to have parameters. And so we were able to demonstrate apolitically, transparently, and accountably which projects were selected and defend those decisions. Um, I think it's important to act now. From Hurricane Katrina experience, I can tell you that uh, while, while uh, you're getting a lot of attention right now, um, that, that attention's going to wait. Uh, the, the, the climate in Congress, obviously, with the, the fiscal pressures, uh, is much worse now than it was in 05 when Katrina hit. You've got to act now. You're, you're looking at a two-year trajectory for your study. I would urge you to identify the no regrets, no re, no brainer projects now and try and push those for construction now. Those components that will be consistent with virtually any plan. Don't wait two years, don't wait three, four years, do it now. When the next disaster happens, you're on the back burner. Um, and so I would urge you to, to, to identify those, uh, those projects that you know uh, have strong support and, and are consistent with long-term efforts. Um, uh, I think it's important to develop a, a single authority or single entity. In Louisiana, we ended up consolidating all of the authority within a coastal board of directors. We, we, we have about six cabinet secretaries, two other independently elected officials, regional representatives. We have one entity that has all of the authority in the coast to where you can't have one agency come in and obstruct or object to progress. That things are done in a monthly meeting, in a public venue, decisions are made, people are held accountable, and you must move forward. Um, and I think uh, instead of getting into the bureaucracy, you've got to strike now where the iron's hot, and you've got to establish a functional implementation structure and have a single authority. Um, keep in mind that all tools are on the table. I heard folks talking about a surge barrier earlier. That may be a good solution, but it's not your only one. Think about non-structural protection. Wetlands, restoring or building ridges and other <coughs> types of structures to help deflect or temper wave energy. Uh, one of the things we did in Louisiana is we engineered oyster reefs in a geometric formation to break wave energy. So we're actually producing oysters and breaking wave energy and cleaning water and sequestering carbon all in the same project, as an example. Um, dedicated streams of funding are critical. The Corps of Engineers can work as hard as they can without some type of uh, visibility on the funding. Uh, having an idea of what funding levels you're going to have one year to the next makes, makes it very difficult. And I think that also, that onus also needs to be imposed upon the local and state governments as well. Uh, last thing I want to say, is that the um, Congressional Budget Office did a study, and they determined that every $3 you invest in proactive mitigation efforts, you have, uh, excuse me, $1 you invest, you have $3 in cost savings. FEMA did a study that says it's $4 in cost savings for every $1 you invest. Congress appropriated $60 billion for your disaster. Think about if you had that money on the front end, what you could have done with it. Don't let this opportunity pass. You guys need to be aggressive, you need to act, you need to make decisions, because the next storm's going to come. Is it next year or is it 30 years? Who knows? It's going to come. Now's the time to act. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. Great.
you know, he, he does, when he leaves New York, he, he does have a Cajun accent that, that you'll hear from him. Uh, next, I want to turn it over to uh, someone who worked sort of on the federal level uh, after Katrina, and that's Dan Hitchings, who's uh, enjoying his second career with Arcadis. But uh, at Katrina, Dan was a senior executive in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers that was confronted with the challenges of, of recovering and mitigating after Hurricane Katrina. So, Dan, let's hear your perspective. Great. Uh, thanks, uh, and I appreciate uh, that uh, Garrett and I learned the same lessons uh, through this. And uh, there was really two phases in the uh, Katrina response, and, and I think if you listen this morning to Colonel Owen uh, talking, he talked about the re repair, restore, um, actions that are going on at this point in time and, and that's what really happened a lot in the New Orleans area and there wasn't really any planning done for that because it was an existing system and it was tweaked to add some improvements to it but what was done following that was a uh, study that had almost the same scope uh, that uh, Rosell spoke about just a minute ago it's a 20 million dollar study coincidental that this one was 20 million we certainly didn't want to do one thing for one area and one thing for another, uh, regardless of the scope. And, uh, and it was for the state of Louisiana, it wasn't just for New Orleans. And the Corps embarked on that study uh, with uh, many of the same conditions that Roselle spoke about. And it's uh, really important to, uh, to recognize as we start this discussion and continue it, is that uh, New York and New Jersey are not New Orleans you know, or Louisiana or the Netherlands. So let's get that behind us. But it's also very important for us to recognize uh, that there's a lot of similarities uh, between uh, the planning, the actions, kinds of things, the types of solutions you would consider uh, to address the problems that you've got. Now, I, I also want to just uh, add that I, I know that uh, my colleagues, and in many cases friends in the Corps of Engineers, are going to do absolutely their very best uh, to do a, a wonderful study, uh, but we have to understand also that they're constrained by the authorities that they're given, uh, by the congressional direction that they've given, uh, by the amount of money that they've been given. Uh, the administration um, also puts some priorities and constraints on that, uh, on interpreting the guidance that comes from things, and they end up writing another letter that says, okay, this is what the law said, but this is what, how we want you to implement that law. And it, you know, it's an understanding because I've just tried to make sure everybody understands what the law said and it's not misinterpreted. There's an official interpretation of it. And the scope of the comprehensive study, um, is, as Rizal said, it, you know, it's $20 million, Virginia to Maine, everything impacted by Sandy. And, and, and as I heard Rizal talk about it, it's like, my God, $20 million, you can't even do the modeling. Uh, for that at any detailed level. All right. <laughs> so uh, the rest of the things I'm going to say are, are almost uh, the same as what uh, Garrett spoke about. So I'm going to go over them real quickly. And I made a list of 10, uh, but it's numbered to 11, so there must be something wrong with the computer. The most important thing when you go through something like this is really at the end to have actionable outcomes. What nobody wants and nobody needs is another study that doesn't give direction on what's next. So we'll always have to be focused and concerned on that aspect of it. It needs to be comprehensive and we all talked about what comprehensive was. I won't go through that again. Integrated solutions um, and I think this is an important thing to realize that the solutions aren't just at the federal level. Uh, we've seen and heard and many of you experienced that uh, local businesses, industries, uh, MTA and Con Ed and various uh, companies are doing things right now uh, to make themselves more resilient, more protected for the next time. That's important. That's very important. There's also another level on there that is at the neighborhood level. Then there's the regional level and ultimately there's the vast regional level. And those solutions uh, need to be cons integrated as we look at this total plan. We talked about resilient and sustainable and what's that definition, but we all know what it really means. We want something that lasts a long time, um, that maybe doesn't totally eliminate uh, the problem, but makes it better. 
and uh, in, in, you know, the core after Katrina uh, changed some of the dialogue and says we're not going to talk about protection anymore. You know, we had a coin jar in our office that every time somebody said protection, you had to put a quarter in, and it got full pretty quick because it was the habit of, of things. The legislation, the projects are called flood protection projects and hurricane protection projects and storm damage protection, but they're not. They're risk reduction. The damage will still be there. And I think, as Philip said earlier today, um, you know, we've got to be careful because when these things get over time, sometimes the damage is worse uh, because there is this false sense of security. Uh, Roselle spoke about engagement. I mean this is huge. I mean this is this is even more complex here than it was in Louisiana. Louisiana was able to establish a single state level government entity. Uh, they also established regional entities uh, to address these uh, things. So it really was a little bit easier operating within a single governmental group uh, than the challenges here with uh, lots and lots of layers uh, in, in several different states involved. We need risk-based decision making uh, because everything isn't uh, the same risk even though it might be the same level because the, the amount of damage that occurs behind those uh, may not be the same. We need to look at the long-term benefits as, as uh, Garrett said Many times the economic analysis that's done through traditional methods um, fail to catch what really is going to be happening. And, and history shows that projects that have been built uh, tend to return far in excess of the benefits that were originally estimated for. Now maybe that's because people develop further behind that area. Um, maybe it's not. The other thing I'm going to say is, is probably not consistent. It's like don't rush to judgment. You've got one big opportunity here to get it right, and it's really, really important that you get it right. And two years will go by in a heartbeat. In fact, several months have already passed, and there's a lot to do. And so I would encourage people to focus on getting it right, worry a little bit less about getting it done on time. I, I know you don't have a choice on that, but uh, you, you really do need to make sure you get it done right in there. So. The, other, the last item that was number 11 really is to look to include private and non-federal investment uh, because there's not enough federal money to do this, there's not enough state money to do this, there's not enough local government money. But we are protecting everybody. We're protecting industries, we're protecting businesses, we're protecting local communities. Uh, insurance uh, in industry is going to be affected by this, so I think by putting a combination of public-private partnerships together, uh, there's an ability then to maybe get more than you would if just you're waiting for the federal government to uh, contribute. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Great time. And, and I want to um, conclude uh, with asking uh, Nikhil uh, Krishnan from McKenzie to talk, and Nikhil's going to, I think, give you a broader perspective on problem solving. He solved, and his company has solved major, major challenges uh, for uh, numerous uh, clients across the world. And uh, Nikhil, why don't you uh, give us some insight on, on uh, your thoughts? Super, thank you. Super, thanks very much. Um, before I start, um, I was actually worried when I was asked uh, to speak here at the panel uh, because I'm actually very seasick. Um, and so the idea of being on a panel uh, while being on a boat, this is kind of a first for me, uh, was, was worrying to me, but it actually is proving to be quite steady and stable even though I'm pointing the wrong direction. Everything's good so far. Um, I still heard it. Um, so so let me uh, begin, uh, uh, you know, some thoughts in terms of, um, you know, just overall observations. There were a lot of things that the uh, members of the panel said that resonated uh, with me. Um, you know, we uh, uh, started looking at this as a firm about five years ago, um, uh, and uh, really started this in partnership with Swiss Re, which is one of uh, uh, the world's largest reinsurance firms, um, and uh, decided about uh, five years ago to partner with them and really thinking about what uh, are risks looking like from natural hazards uh, today and in the future, and therefore what should resilience and um, uh, measures and uh, risk reduction measures uh, therefore look like, and how can we help our clients, which are largely a mixture of uh, private sector as well as public sector entities, better prepare for the future? 
Um, and, and what triggered this really was some uh, analysis by Swiss Re, and a lot of this is publicly available uh, from Swiss Re or Munich uh, or, or some of their competition, which actually showed a pretty alarming trend in terms of insurance costs. Um, and when you look at insurance costs over the past 10 or 15 years, um, there has been a, an exponential increase in the overall um, costs faced by the industry in the last uh, uh, four or five, five years with a sort of a market trend in the last 10 years. Um, and uh, it's not just insured costs, but actually also real economic damage uh, has been in increasing exponentially. Um, now, not all of this is because of climate change. Actually, a big portion of this uh, uh, increase that we have seen recently is because of development. Um, and we, and uh, this echoes some of the themes that, uh, that uh, some of my uh, 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 colleagues on the panel have been sharing, which is we have in the, in the last several years started to build increasingly in some of the most risky areas. Um, and this really prompted uh, the, the work in collaboration with Swiss Re. Um, and so what I'm going to focus my thoughts on um, uh, today is more of uh, you know, the, the overall uh, lessons learned. We've now done this uh, kind of work around natural hazard risk and res resilience in about 40 locations around the world, working for a range of public and private sector clients. A lot of um, our work is confidential. So when I was asked to speak today, I was, um, I'm going to direct my comments around the problem solving and some of the ideas around how to scope and think about, uh, uh, about these challenging issues. Just one more thought before I'm, I, I jump in, uh, and that's uh, I've been doing this now for about four years. Um, uh, you know, doing this work in uh, in risk um, uh, and and resilience, but this is the first time that it was real for me because I live in Brooklyn, um, and having gone through this experience, made it extremely personal. And uh, so, um, uh, so it's it's been a it's been an extremely uh, you know painful time. Um, now. Uh, let me start with um, this idea around um, uh, uh, around analysis. Uh, our perspective is that uh, there is, there are always uh, a lot of nuances and a lot of pressure uh, when it comes to thinking about what actions to take. Uh, multiple interests, uh, you know, people have very different perspectives. But what is always a unifying uh, factor, and what gets um, coalitions together and what gets people um, discussing and debating in, in, in my experience and in a very proactive and positive way is some sense of a common fact base. Um, and that's why as the, the notion of studies is, is a very powerful one. Um, our perspective is that um, a quantitative is actually very helpful in thinking about these kind of issues and being quantitative not just in terms of the risk uh, quantifying the uh, from an economic perspective risk but also con quantifying both the costs as well as the benefits of various measures uh, and trying to put as much of that while it does not capture all the nuances and all the uh, all the additional layers and prioritizations that Garrett for example mentioned in in, in his remarks uh, starting with that common quantitative fact base around uh, economic damage, uh, around costs, around benefits, is actually extremely powerful because it unlocks the debate and allows the other discussions and prioritizations to occur on top. Um, uh, and then, when thinking about a quantitative fact base, there are often um, a set of no regrets moves that emerge very quickly, um, and not all of this um, relies on significant capital investment. Not all of this relies on uh, significant infrastructure spend. Um, so in thinking about the set of solutions, um, our experience uh, has been that there are a significant set of solutions that um, are potentially no regrets, capital light that everybody can sort of agree on and move forward quickly. Um, there are some that are, uh, are certainly you know, big options that, are, that need to be debated on the other end of the spectrum. And then there are, there are, uh, there are um, a, a suite of options that are kind of in the middle that can be resolved with, uh, with sort of minimum uh, investment uh, and, uh, and, and some uh, coalition across groups. Um, <laughs> and it linked to this thinking about uh, maybe no regrets measures, big options, and something in the and and, and a set of options in the middle, uh, is is a concept around not all of this uh, or a concept around cross sectoral measures. So, and what I mean by that is thinking about all facets of uh, of economic activity, infrastructure, um, uh, GDP, uh, vulnerable populations, and then thinking about a range of different measures, whether they are. Uh, flood barriers or building code changes, um, temporary flood walls, 
um, uh, and not just the measures that are around uh, hardening systems, but also measures that allow for rapid recovery and quantifying the benefits and 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 and, uh, um, and uh, uh, economic value from from bouncing back fast, whether it's an electric grid system or a water system, it may be fine that uh, that it is down for a period of time as long as you can get it back fast. Um, and uh, we try to think about all those measures in, an, in a, in a like-for-like -like manner, and uh, as well as the last measure, uh, which is um, uh, which is usually around risk transfer. And at some point, there is a debate around insurance, and the role of insurance um, uh, needs to be examined carefully. Um, just a few other uh, um, other uh, remarks. One is around time frame. I know this co this question comes up repeatedly, and this is time frame both in terms of thinking about where our risks are going in the future, uh, where natural hazards are going to going to evolve given uh, different climate ch change scenarios or, or future pathways, um, as well as where economic growth is going, um, and also time frame for response. Uh, and are we thinking about response? You know, in the next 10 or 20 years, are we thinking about in measures that are going to be around for 50 years um, or end of the century? You know, how are we thinking about the time frames of both risk and, and response? Um, and in our uh, in, uh, and there's no clear answer here because um, a lot of the actions um, are not just government actions, but also private sector and individual actions. So accounting for different time periods, potentially different discount rates, different NPD calculations is often a part of the mix. And it's uh, it's not a it's not a clean process, but often um, my experience is the best ones uh, best ones involve uh, or embrace that nuance and actually try to capture quantitatively um, the uh, the different profiles and investment timeframes of the different parties. Um, and then lastly, uh, I, I would just hit upon this idea of scenarios, which is we're never going to solve everything precisely in any study in terms of one future state that we align on and and make decisions around but often painting a picture in terms of what are a few different scenarios so that we can at least align on, uh, uh, um, on some of the, the range of possible outcomes. Uh, and, then, uh, um, and then through the, that scenario analysis, that's how a set of no regrets moves often pops out. Um, so let me pause there in, in the interest of time. I hope I kept that relatively short. Thank you, Nikhil. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Okay, uh, I, there's, uh, I know we have three by five cards uh, that are going to be uh, uh, picked up and brought up. But uh, first I want to give our uh, newly promoted respondents a chance to uh, ask one question. Uh, I'm looking for, uh, I'm looking, I'm looking for Philip. Uh, are you ready for us to ask a question, Philip? Or should I go to Malcolm first? Am I ready to ask the yeah. question? Give me a minute. All right, good. I'm going to ask uh, Malcolm. Um, I have a question for Roselle about this uh, local <coughs> coastal, about the New York Coastal Comprehensive Study. Um, I welcome this, a 20 million study, uh, in less of, or two years. But the thing that bothered me, Roselle, is that you said that it would be consistent with other plans. Now, could you please explain what that means? Because um, what we need is strong leadership, and if everybody's waiting to be consistent, that you will have to uh, resort to the lowest common denominator, will you? Um, and sometimes the best, uh, the best plans of the Army Corps uh, are stymied by some, sometimes local special interest groups. You think of the the Fire Island Montauk Point study that for decades has been held up because people don't want their view blocked on the South Shore Long Island. Thank you. Well, the directive to be consistent with other plans came from Congress, so I can't argue with them uh, within my pay grade. But uh, what we interpret that to mean is that our recommendations have to reflect those plans and build upon them. So, the, <clears throat> excuse me, there may be a regional perspective that could build upon, I'll use the word transcend, a local recommendation. Uh, and that is consistent with how the federal government proceeds when the Corps of Engineers pr develops plans. We develop a, a plan that's in the federal interest and then we recognize locally preferred plans. 
uh, this plan, uh, this study, is to develop recommendations, and as I noted, it's to identify institutional barriers to implementing a comprehensive strategy. So I think that might address your second question about how we overcome some of the challenges in our coastal zone management, which are very real. Public access to beaches that the federal government has expended funds to nourish is, is a given in our, in our lane, in, in the Corps of Engineers lane. May not be consistent with local plans. However, Congress has directed us to identify those institutional barriers, and that might be an example of one, that in order to have a comprehensive plan in place that the federal government participated in, there had to be public access to those locations. Um, we could probably generate a long list of other social and institutional barriers to a truly comprehensive plan that reduces risk in our region, uh, but that would be one of the outcomes of our study. Philip, over to you. I, I, uh, I like Nikhil's point that they've been trying to understand, or that they're observing that risk is not changing. We're, we're having more increasing coastal dam damages um, from coastal storms, and it's not necessarily because of climate change. The bigger factor that we know more about is that it's because of increasing vulnerability. So my question would be, what can we do in this adaptation for our region to stop that? You know, is there any, are there any steps we can take to try to avoid that? And I mean, part of coastal adaptation may be the problem is that we're adapting coasts and protecting, I don't know actually, I don't know what the problem is exactly. The insurance system, FEMA's insurance program is being, um, it's being changed and modified. So I think it's actually, <laughs> not preaching. That was my question, but I'll also point, I will point out that, FEMA, okay, I'll let you guys answer. But that's my question is how can we reduce the vulnerability part in our, in our adaptation? Who wants to take that off? Um, I, I, can, I can kick it off, but then I'm actually going to bounce it to Garrett. No, warning in advance. Um, so, um, you know, my, uh, our, our take is, um, yes, so you, you, we do see uh, very um, sharply increasing trends in terms of economic loss, um, and a lot of that is driven by um, vulnerability, increasing vulnerability because of uh, development in the most vulnerable areas. Um, there are, a, uh, uh, all, you know, in most areas where I've done this, there are usually, uh, uh, you know, when, you talk, when you're talking about a city scale, usually 20 to 30 to literally hundreds of actions that can be taken to reduce risk um, or to come up or to recover faster across sectors. Um, and that helps with thinking through what you can do to reduce the damage um, or impact of storms uh, given the current uh, built infrastructure. Now the big challenge and the big question to my mind is how does infrastructure develop going forward? Um, and you know that requires some real hard thinking in terms of uh, of planning, development, zoning. How do you want to shape the future of, of, of an area going forward? And that's where I'm actually going to bounce it to Garrett because um, I don't think there's any, uh, any uh, simple answers here, but maybe your experience from Louisiana might shed some light. Um, again, I want to preface by saying that I, I don't want to pretend to be intimately familiar with, with what you guys are trying to achieve here. Um, but I can talk about our experiences in Louisiana. Uh, number one, is that in Louisiana, we, we actually drew a line in the sand. Um, we, we determined that folks basically below the line, we're not gonna be able to protect those areas anymore. And so what we did for those areas is number one, uh, we have a uh, elevation program where we let folks know, look, we will help you elevate your home, but that's it. Um, we also have a relocation program where we'll move you above the line uh, for those that, um, that, that would prefer that option. Uh, very challenging decision, very painful decision for a lot of folks, and I wish we didn't have to make it, but based upon a realistic plan, we were forced to, 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 to include that in our plan. 
Um, secondly, you, you noted the whole uh, zoning ordinance issue, which is often a local uh, tool, and I talked about all the tools being on the table earlier. Um, the zoning ordinances and building standards are absolutely critical. They're oftentimes sort of the last line of defense there, but they're one of the most critical. And whether that is, is using building standards that will withstand uh, a certain wind speed, uh, homes that, uh, that are elevated. Brad Pitt uh, did a, uh, a project in, in New Orleans, one of the really devastated areas in New Orleans, actually built homes on hulls. So the homes are on the ground and they look very traditional, but when the water comes up, they actually are on a, uh, they're on a beam and they, they float. Um, and so looking at, 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 at opportunities to use zoning ordinances and building standards to complement. The last thing is, and this is really important because it's going to influence your ultimate outcome, is that uh, in July of last year, Congress passed the Bigger Waters National Flood Insurance Reform Program. I'm not clear on how many homes are, are require flood insurance in this area, but it is going to pivot from a subsidized uh, premium to an actual, to actuarial rate. To give you a quick statistic in Louisiana, a uh, $200,000 home with $80,000 worth of contents. I don't think that'll buy you a box here, but in Louisiana, it's a home. Uh, the, the, the rates will go from about $2,200 a year in some instances uh, to $25,000 a year. That redraws the map. So you can either, you can either let that happen and, and you can, in effect, uh, force um, you know, trail of tears, or you can get in front of it and actually help to transition people into more sustainable areas.